Uh, my name is Ursula Hovanitz and I am responsible for bringing you here today. Uh, and I'm a part of a team that uh, set up an uh, immigrating landscape, a project of series of seminars that will last from today. Today is the first uh, seminar till December. And there will be altogether eight seminars. Welcome to the first uh, seminar within the Immigrating Landscapes, a seminar on contemporary emigration and its literary and artistic representation. Today we have a great pleasure to, to have with us Professor Iri Drogov from Goldsmith University and uh, mm, a Polish artist, uh, Joanna Rajkowska. And they will be um, talking, I mean, setting up a discussion. We will hear about the theory of uh, um, exhausted geography by uh, Iri Drogov, and then the presentation, some sort of commentary by Jan Rajkowska. Uh, for me, it is a fantastic opportunity to meet up today and to start this first, uh, to this new project and this, uh, to have this first seminar. And I have uh, um, a pleasure to, to thank and to be grateful for support and help of many colleagues and friends who made this project possible. Well, I have to thank first uh, uh, of all uh, CEAS director Robin Eisenwood, uh, Eisenwood who was uh, a great supporter of this project from the, from the very beginning, and my colleague Tim Beasley Murray and uh, Katarzyna Zahenter who, for the enthusiasm for the initial ideas. The financial support as well as the intellectual input and moral involvement, I have to say, I owe to Polish Cultural Institute and a wonderful Joanna Raczynska, the PCI head of, the p of literature. I uh, would like to thank uh, UCL European Institute, especially Alex Katsaitis for his support. And I have to thank CIS Center for the Study of Central Europe and Richard Butterwick Pawlikowski for also for his financial and moral and intellectual support, as well as our co-organizer of press publication company and Marek Raczynski, who will kindly uh, who kindly agreed to lead the discussion afterward this uh, this uh, presentation. For all help in administration. And administration of the project, I wish to thank Cristina Fernandez, Siobhan Pipa, and my great students Cecilia Pittel and Inka Roszkowska. And last but not least, I thank Irit and Joanna for accepting our invitation, as well as all other speakers in subsequent seminars, which will be held next week on the March of the 20th of March, 30th of uh, uh, 13th of uh, May, and 20th of. June, and you can follow us on the website and Facebook. The website is there, but just um, the uh, computer um, stopped working, as usual. Um, just bear with me two more minutes. The seminar then brings together Professor Iri Drogov and the artist Joanna Rajkowska aims at giving a space for discussion on contemporary migration, geography, maps, and pres present crisis of the borders, as well as the connection to political and ideological tension and its artistic representation. The reason for initiating this seminar, uh, of this, this series of seminar, was the recent influx of uh, Polish emigration to UK. How can this and other similar contemporary migration phenomena in, Euro in Europe enrich our knowledge of belonging. This is probably the most appealing <coughs> question that lies behind the idea of immigrating landscapes. Instead of traditional approach of historical, also within literary history, analysis of the process, the organizers of the event wanted to bring together various ideas on belongings, geography of our contemporary world, and uh, the role of borders within it. Iri Drogov will present her theory of exhausted geography, which will be followed by the related presentation of artistic projects by Joanna Rajkowska. This dialogue does not aim at answering, at, uh, answering any questions as about whom the contem contemporary migrants or emigrants are, including Poles in UK. On the contrary, it aims at juxtaposing new ideas, theories, and opinions 
in order to pose new queries and see the ever ch quicker changing contemporary world beyond recognized maps, orders, and beyond frequently asked questions. In a nutshell, the immigrating, se em immigrating seminars aspire to a search for inquiries with which have not yet been thought rather than giving def definite answers. You will all be asked uh, to contributing in to that through discussion. Without further ado, I give the floor to Irit Rogov. And once again, thank you, and thank you for coming. I'm going to sit on the table to be slightly nearer. Um, it's really nice to be back here. I used to come here when I was a student, um, and it was some other building and some other formation. And I was a student at the Courtauld Institute for many years, and I was a Germanist and a sort of Central Europeanist, which was a subject nobody taught and nobody studied. And so I was sort of running around London looking for kindred spirits and related materials. And I found a seminar here on Fandus Jekyll Vienna, which was full of ex-spies who really came for the tea and biscuits and not for the seminars. And so it was a kind of, of very different manifestation of what the School of Eastern European and Slavonic Studies is. And it's nice to see that it's had such a great influx of energy and, and new and current problematics rather than nostalgic ones, which is what it used to be. Um, I wanted to um, bring up a notion of exhausted geographies. And they are, I think, related to the problematics of um, the movements of people across the globe, but more so to the problematics of the regimes, uh, the different kinds of regimes that work to contain and restrict and, and hold in um, rather than um, sort of, of play out the inevitable mobilities of a post-colonial, post-migratory, post-communist world. Um, I think that I'll try, um, if it's not too dense, I'll try and, and sort of, of give account of the different kinds of exhaustions of geography that, that um, I'm interested in. Now, we, we come at the tail end. Um, I should say maybe at the beginning, I'm not a geographer. I'm sort of a cultural theorist. I'm interested in, in contemporary art, politics, philosophy, the intersections between them. And um, my interest in geography has been not so much in artworks that illustrate the problematics of contemporary geography, but in the way in which sort of contemporary creative practices perform a whole set of what I think of as geographical problems. So it's not iconographic or formal or sub, uh, sort of substantive in the sense of subject matter and much more a series of kind of affective performances of how we might arrive at the geographical rather than inherit a whole set of given notions of the geographical. So I think we come at the tail end of three sort of, of very big bodies of geographical perception. One of them is the Enlightenment project and colonial geography. And these are two very, very linked projects um, that have to do with the sort of mapping out of the world and the mapping out of the world from the centers of Western knowledge and um, the centers of colonial power. So if you've ever given any thought to why the Middle East is the Middle East and the middle of whose East this is, um, then this has to do with the fact that places like the Middle East, the Far East, um, Central Asia, etc., are mapped out from the colonial office, the State Department, the Quai d'Orsay, etc. They're mapped out from the centers of colonial power in relation to themselves. The, so distance and proximity and so on. Um, the colonial project of geography 
um, which used a, used a whole set of enlightenment tools, had to do really with the cataloging of the world, uh, with many, many registers of knowledge in terms of how one catalogues and, and transcribes um, a set of material realities and, of course, their cultural inscriptions. Um, so that's one register of geography that we have to keep in mind. Another register of geography is national geography. This is a later project um, which emerges with the nation state of the 19th century and in which borders um, become one of the, the most important, restrictive, sort of operative tools of geography. So the national geography has um, the double impetus of containment and division. So national geography aims at the kind of containment and coherence of what is within and the division of that entity from what is without. And thirdly, um, contemporary global geography which um, transcends the nation state, transcends the, sen the traditional centers um, of power, the traditional centers of production, um, and produces a set of global networked relations around the sort of, of, of another model of diffusionism, not the old 16th century model of European diffusionism, which was at the heart of the colonial project, but a model of related networks. And so the, the sort of, of a, a kind of global geography that is made out of trade agreements, out of link deregulations of economies and production processes, out of the movement of capital through um, a set of, of electronic linked networks, and so a geography in which we have to think um, not about centers of production, but about a kind of diffuse model of production, which is divided into a whole set of entities, assembled at other entities, distributed um, at other points of, of uh, dissemination, etc. And so we have these three registers of geography, which of course are continuously operating simultaneously. Right? We are still operating within a body of enlightenment geography, we are still operating within national geographical registers, and we're operating within uh, global geographies. Now, the, the global geographies, and, and it's something that I'll, I, I'm going to try and get um, to towards the end if I have enough time, have also produced a whole set of counter processes of globalization. There are a few people who were in, in class today at Goldsmith, and um, so they will be hearing things that they heard earlier today um, under the guise of another argument, so my apologies. Um, the, the global, oh my god, it's snowing. The, the, the global geographies have produced um, a kind of set of emergent um, counter processes of globalization. And um, they are elusive and ephemeral and incredibly interesting. And um, we've just spent two terms trying to kind of materialize and texturize and, and, and give them form and shape. Um, and I think that the, the vocabulary, the set of concerns and the vocabulary that they've produced are absolutely relevant for the kind of questions, I think, that this series of, of seminars um, is, has, is putting forward. Within the current culture of migrations and border regimes, the line of division that rears its ugly head again and again and which operates as an alibi for a seemingly necessary set of operations of gatekeeping. Uh, by invo invoking the notion of exhausted geography 
I want to intervene in this, um, in what, what is to me a series of, of, of really of alibis um, at two levels. I th I'm thinking of exhausted geographies in terms of the ideological energies that are required for sustaining long-term territorial conflict, which is, I think, one type of exhaust geographical exhaustion that we're going through. And the other is the counter system to that of global geographical management, which is emerging from the many economic and organizational processes that have emerged at the inter interstices of top-down macro-political globalization. Now, I, I think that um, I, I want to start with the exhaustion that I think afflicts long-term territorial conflict, the inability to sustain long-term ter territorial conflict, where I think there's one set of kind of fictional narratives that are at play in the effort to sustain it, in, in an unsustainable effort to sustain it. And the other is um, exhausted geographies at the level of the kind of things that um, the responses to the macro politics of globalization are kind of putting forth. And they are terms such as stakeholding as opposed to uh, belonging that is based on identity and the legitimation of that identity through citizenship, etc. So I think that's one of the ways in which uh, we have exhausted the claims of geography by thinking about stakeholding rather than, than belonging. Uh, another one is co-citizenship, Etienne Balibar's notion of co-citizenship, where he talks um, in, in a very interesting and elaborate way uh, about the, the case of the sans-papier um, in France and the fact that the condition of being without papers, the condition of living in a country in which you have none of the trappings of legality and legitimation should not be resolved by the simple attempt to grant legality and, 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 um, and the ability to visibly participate that instead what is necessary in response to the, to, um, the condition of the sans-papier is what he calls co-citizenship. Um, that the sans-papier crisis needs to be taken up in order to re-examine those who have belonging, those who have citizenship, and to recognize that contemporary social relations are made up of the dynamics of co-citizenship between those who are legitimate and those who are not legitimate. So in actual fact, what Balibar is arguing, and I think this is a very, very important argument in order to exhaust geography, is that it is not the simple question of alleviating a condition by thinking of it as a lack but as recognizing it as an important stimulus to re-examine our citizenship, our citizenship that we take for granted, that we see as a set of, a set of given protocols um, in which we're allowed to participate, we're allowed to have rights, and so on. And that the, the pressure from campaigns such as the Sans Papier campaign um, is one that needs to produce a shared condition of co-citizenship. So I think of co-citizenship as one of the ways of exhausting geography, of exhausting the lines of division and containment, identity, legitimation that are granted by the machinations of geography. Questions of biopolitical management uh, which we find certainly in migration regimes, certainly in the, the mobility of people around the globe, um, and which again um, 
in 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 sort of of the hands of critical practices uh, allow us to move away from externalized conditions to um, the internalization of regimes of belonging and of, of, of segregation. And finally, um, ex what to me are extremely important notions and particularly important in relation to um, to kind of creative practices, and it's maybe where we might sort of, of, of have a meeting point, questions of smuggling and of contamination. Um, sm questions of smuggling and contamination are another facet of the way in which um, geography is exhausted, right? The, the, in which the regimes um, that relegate legitimacy um, relegate comprehension and visibility and knowability, right, um, are exhausted um, and in which sort of, of both subjects, products um, that are in uh, the process of moving along not quite visible, not quite legitimate lines produce a set of contaminations which they carry with them and um, which break down the kind of li lines of division that we've inherited from classical geography. So um, these these are sort of, of, of the lines in which I want to argue the notion of exhausted geography. And I'll start with, the, with notions of territoriality and long-term um, conflict. In a, in a book that I found um, extremely interesting and valuable at many le different levels of my work, Jacques Derrida's The Eyes of the University, a book that he published when he was founding the Collège de Philosophie in Paris in the early 1980s, um, and in which he talks about what it is to destine yourself uh, to produce a new platform of knowledge that um, is not particularly disciplined, um, has no particular set of aims in mind. This is not a teaching institution that grants degrees and therefore it doesn't intervene in the professional economies of philosophy. Um, the, he talks about the fact that boundaries, whether narrow or expanded, do nothing more than set out the limits of the possible. And my question is, how then can we put forward an engaged discussion of place or location that is not held captive by the logics of division and containment, that does not again and again do the work of setting up conflict and reconciliation in terms of a binary of engaged protagonists. Even when these protagonists are entirely committed to transcending their conditions and location, they're still doing so from the opening shot of being situated subjects. So perhaps one of the ways of doing so is by an understanding the geography is not location, but is a situated knowledge. Who we are, where we are, what we know, what our heritages and allegiances are, has always been linked to geography, not as a set of locating vectors, but rather to yoke places to traditions and trajectories of knowledge. Each place knows differently. And if they are not to be related to one another in dated and irreverent, irrelevant notions of knowledge from the center versus knowledge from the periphery, then how might they produce circular movements of knowledge which defies geographical subjugation? 
The concept of exhausted geographies that I'm trying to discuss here is a concept that is trying to work against the grain of both the boundaries of the possible, as Derrida articulates it, and of location as the site of identity and knowledge. At the opening of the recent Istanbul Biennale, at the edges of a small project I was running there, a group of us is having coffee and discussing a possible future project. It is a frustrating conversation because it is virtually impossible for us to meet anywhere in the region which has brought us together in the first place. We come from several different countries in the Middle East. We work together in numerous institutions in Europe, but we cannot meet in the region. There are so many politically and ethnically imposed travel restrictions that our project seems undoable. Then Christine from Beirut says, wait, we can meet in Amman. There's no one from Jordan amongst us. There's no Jordanian institution that has expressed any interest in us or our ideas. To be perfectly sure, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure any of us is that interested in Jordan per se. But in we need in some way to exhaust the belligerent geography of our region, and this seems a way. The entire terrain of this conflict-riddled region is sustained by the tension of unbreachable borders, politically driven restrictions, and the willingness to uphold divisions born of enmity. Our little gathering over coffee in Istanbul is in itself a relational geography, a way of bringing located cultures into unimaginable contact with one another, a move from binary oppositions to fragmented identifications affected through a dispersal of that which sustains enmity. Now, the exhaustion of which I speak has little to do with personal fatigue. I should say that being at the outset that being tired, being spent, being unable to resist the pressures to do more and more, more speaking, more lecturing, more teaching, more writing, more traveling, more curating, more protesting, more criticizing, is not really my concern <laughs> here. I agree in, in principle with Jan Ververt's uh, premise and a large exhibition that he did called Exhaustion and Exuberance, that the hyperactive lives that characterize our contemporary art world are a function of the shift to an immaterial mode of labor in which this is undoubtedly an important economy to resist. But I would wish my exhaustion to be more than a mode of resistance. I would wish it to be more generative, to be the site of a paradigm shift rather than a corrective. And so I've been thinking of exhaustion in relation to political conflict, not a mode of opting out and withdrawing, but one of recognizing the limits of a logic that has dominated that conflict for most of its duration. I suspect that this will take the form of an act of treason, in Deleuze's sense of treachery, a refusal to support and sustain that which it demands of you because it claims to support and sustain you. For in the realm of li living out long-term political conflict, treason and exhaustion are not unrelated to one another. Conflict requires energy, resources, enthusiasm, or fatalistic resignation. It demands clear-cut positions, clear-cut belongings, which in turn demand, demand to be defended at all costs. In situations of ongoing conflict, in those places and spaces in which it has been going on for what seems like an eternity, a certain moment of recognition invariably comes in, which all of the efforts and sacrifices, the losses, injustices, oppressions that have been perpetuated and endured suddenly seem to be propagating the very thing that they seemingly attempted to resolve. That is the instance of treason, the moment in which one refuses to read the scenario in the terms that it has been set up for itself and reveal it to be the mechanism of its own perpetuation.
When one is deeply in the grip of a narrative, every detail of it assumes great meaning. But when its right to grip you is questioned, these twists and turns that have sutured us into a com as complicit participants are revealed to be preoccupied with little but their own legitimation. And so the minute internal differences of this minister saying this and the other saying the opposite, of successive prime ministers and presidents offering plans and roadmaps and revised orders, of political prisoners being released on the back of one political incentive only to be re-imprisoned or assassinated as part of the next wave of retaliations or of shifts towards an increasingly hardline tactic. All of these stage themselves as earth-shaking developments within the inner workings of a logic that is closed in on itself, as all such logics are. The exhausted geographies of which I speak are the material manifestations of what I'm trying to describe, territorialities and territorial claims that cannot sustain themselves. Now, there's um, a segment here which um, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, of try and keep to a minimum, which has to do with 60 years of territorial conflict between Israel and Palestine. Um, in which I have a significant um, sort of investment in unsinking critically. And I'll keep this slightly short because I want to get to um, the alibi of migration. Um, in inhabiting long-term and chronically unresolved political conflict, such as the one be that has been ongoing between Israel and Palestine for some 60 years, we come to moments of total exhaustion. This sense of exhaustion derives from spent energies, disappointed good intentions, numerous conflict-related deprivations on all sides, the utilization of bankrupt models of political analysis, the inability to foresee a constructive future, future strategy, and numerous other dimensions of living out a long-term conflict. I'm thinking of the time and the energies spent in being critical, in resisting, of the construction of great projects of critical theory and the deconstruction of the dominant ideology, of the writing and teaching and protesting and having argue, angry arguments over family dinners, of saying or thinking without saying that I never again want to have to spend an evening with someone who does not share the belief that the occupation of Palestine is the degree zero, the foundational cause and the absolute limit state of everything that has gone wrong in our Middle East. Amongst the friends who belong to the community of the critical, moments of exhausted recognition can be seen as a turn to cynicism, an opting out, a withdrawal, a turning inwards. But that seems to me to be saying there is no other way of living out a political conflict but in energetic engagement with it on its own terms. At these moments of political exhaustion, we might actually exit a mode that seeks resolution to conflict and enter another temporality, which is one of inhabitation. These exhausted geographies are neither the maps or the traces of territorial entities, but rather the lines of flight that exit from such enterprises into an imaginative sphere that would produce a different set of relations between the components, a move from binarism to dispersal. Thus, an exhausted geography is not a territorial entity, but rather a temporal one a suspension of both the time and the terms framed by the state. It is, if you like, the move from treason, which holds the subject euridically to the structures and rules of state institutions, such as army or public institutions, or to the ideological convictions which underpin political parties and social movements, to the moment of betrayal, an act, betrayal which has as much to do 
with giving up something oneself as it does with letting down the expectations of those around one. It is also an act of self-excommunication. The temporal suspension that I have in mind, the temporal suspension, which is, I think, what is able to exhaust geography. Because it, it's not that we get delivered in an exhausted geography. We have to, almost on a daily basis, exhaust geography. Right? We have to suck out of it the energies that allow it to sustain itself um, as a mechanism of division and containment. So the temporal suspe suspension that I have in mind has much to do with Giorgio Agamben's Homo Sacer, which has occupied my thoughts for some time, and with his conception of bare life, life which is stripped of every facet of human concern and protection, but has not yet entered the symbolic order of the sacrificed, of those whose death can sit comfortably within a juridical order. So I think of Homo Sacer, I think maybe very differently from many of the readings that I've come across um, of bare life. I think of it as a temporal suspension. I think of it as a temporal gap between um, what, what Agamben says, he who is sacrificed, um, who is, he who is dead but not yet sacrificed, right? So the, the sort of, of the evacuation of conditions which we, in a kind of liberal democracy, would agree are the enabling conditions of life. So the evacuation of those conditions, but not yet um, the, the entry into um, the, the sort of, of, of state of deathly sacrifice, right? So it's, it's it, and this really interests me as a kind of, of temporal gap, as, as an act of, of suspension. The temporal suspension in bare life for Agamben is embodied by the figure of Homo Sacer, um, he who may be killed and yet not sacrificed. This is an obscure figure of archaic Roman law in which human life is included in the juridical order solely in the form of its exclusion, i.e. of its capacity of being killed. Uh, the figure of Homo Sacer is used by Agamben to argue two points. One is that together with the principle that the exception everywhere becomes the rule, the realm of bare life, which is originally situated at the margins of the political order, gradually begins to coincide with the political realm and exclusions and inclusions outside and inside enter into a zone of irreducible distinction. At once excluding bare life from and capturing it within the political order, the state of exception actually constituted in its very separateness the hidden foundation in which the entire political system rested. So this is one, um, one argument that Agamben has used for bare life. And, um, and the other is another process is set in motion that in large measure corresponds to b the birth of modern democracy, in which man, as a living being, presented himself as no longer an object, but as a subject of political power. These two processes, bitterly opposed, converge insofar as both concern the bare life of the citizen, a new biopolitical body of humanity. So I want to argue this temporal gap, this suspension um, of time, which is implicit in the notion, as the temporality of political and geographical exhaustion. In this state, we move beyond criticism of regimes and players and intentions and policies, and from critique, 
of the underlying political and ideological structures that have captured and seized the conflict, whatever the conflict is, and to continue and continue to hold it ransom to their logic, and towards um, what is a very important term for me now, the notion of criticality, a condition in which we both see through the condition of our lives while continuing to live out their difficulties. I, maybe, how much time do I have? And I should I should sort of of, of say something um, about the terms that I'm using. I've I've been trying to think in terms of the passage from criticism, a kind of mid twentieth century model, which is about the possibility of uh, applying judgment, um, of dealing with values and of being in a, in a sort of affected separation, in a state of affected separation from the thing that one is addressing. So the, the sort of, of project of criticism in which one has a set of terms, one has a set of values, one engages in the operation of, of judgment, and one affects a kind of separatedness. Um, from the whatever it is that is being addressed to the the kind of post structuralist project of critique uh, which followed it and um, which shifted the terms entirely from uh, value and judgment to a series of questions uh, concerning the 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 assumptions and the paradigms that underlie something's ability to circulate in the world as a truth claim, right? So the project of critique, of a, a sort of very, very long and, and, and uh, expansive project, you know, from the early work and structuralist work of Foucault to sort of, of, of the middle period of Deleuze and Guattari's work together, in which um, the 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 examination kind of moves to conditions of possibility legitimating narratives epistemological assumptions paradigmatic frameworks and does not assume a truth but assumes a sort of circulations discursive disciplinary political um, circulations of something operating as a set of truth claims to what really interests me these days, and which I call criticality, uh, probably for lack of any better ability to invent another term. I know that it's an already um, occupied term. Now, what, what interests me in criticality is that coming, you know, formed as I was by the operations of post-structuralist critique, um, obviously, we have all of the tools at our disposal to kind of unveil and expose and, and, and um, ascertain the operations of certain kinds of truth regimes. Nevertheless, we're not separate from them because the, the, we are living out the very conditions of that which we are critically analyzing. So criticality, for me, is the joint operations of, on the one hand, being able to do the analytical world work, and on the other hand, to inhabit those very conditions that one is talking about. So it's the operation of breaking down the affected separateness of judgment, the affected separateness of criticism. Um, and and um, and of enacting what Hannah Arendt so beautifully called um, "we refugees," right? The the sort of, of that mutuality of what it is to be we refugees, rather those who belong and those who don't. 
Um, and so criticality has been one of the, the sort of, of, of most important terms that I have. So my question is, what do the politics of criticality, so much less directed and goal-oriented than political resolutions, have to afford, um, to, to offer to the exhaustion of geographies? Criticality being at once the ability to see through the structures that we're living in and to analyze them in a theoretically informed way, while at the same time to recognize that for all of one's critical apparatus, one is nevertheless living out those very conditions. Of course, criticality has critique enfolded within it, but it is more. It is a conscious duality of both living out something while being able to see through it, and it requires another mode of articulation, one that cannot smugly stand outside the problems and offer a clever and knowing analysis. Instead, it requires that the experiential dimension of what we are living out be brought into contact with the analytical. And of course, one of the reasons I so value a notion of criticality is because it does not allow for either cynicism or sarcasm, which are the ultimate expressions of knowing outsidership. Instead, the need to navigate the terrain at levels of analysis, feeling, and mutuality emerge in what Hannah Arendt has so beautifully termed, we fellow sufferers. And I want to finish this part with a story. On a New Year's Eve in London a few years ago, I had, without thinking, accepted an invitation to a party at the home of some very delightful and enlightened Lebanese friends. It was only when I was dressed and ready to go that it occurred to me that I would probably be the only Israeli there and that it might prove uncomfortable at some level. But I was in a festive mood and decided to risk it. In the event, my fears were unfounded. It was a really wonderful evening. Some new fusion music was emerging from Beirut, and everybody was dancing in that way you do when a new sound grips you. There was a lot of champagne, and at some point in the evening, our host, a famous Lebanese journalist, got up on the table and gave a mock speech emulating the turgid rhetoric of many Arab leaders, blaming every conspiratorial force from al-Yahud, the Jews, the, to the imperialists, the British, to the forces of capitalist exploitation, the Americans, and so on, while everyone fell about laughing. In the middle of all this hilarity, a very beautiful woman, lithe and elegant, was twirling science sinuously to the music. She even had on a neat dress with the shape of a cat on it, which accentuated the overall feline quality of her movements. At some point in the evening we were introduced, and she turned out to be Chatham House's commentator on Arab affairs. A Hijazi from Saudi Arabia, an astute political analyst of considerable independence, and not a little flair. In the early hours of the morning, flush with all this partying, we finally managed to get a cab to take us back, and this woman asked if we would drop her off at her home on the way. I think we were all quite drunk, and I don't remember much of the ride, but at some point she turned to me and said quite solemnly, it bodes very well for you as an Israeli that you brought in the new year in the company of such excellent Arabs. <laughs> Obviously, I was charmed by the situation and the wonderful rhetorical turn of phrase, the odd but quite lovely designation of being such excellent Arabs. But it is also this moment that I would claim for exhaustion. Not because a gesture of friendship that shatters the enmities in which we exist, for I have many friendships in Palestine, even several ongoing collaborations that need to take place below the radar of prohibitions and boycotts from both sides. 
but because my mind leapt beyond the endlessly rehearsed political camps, territorial divisions, and the ideological and pragmatic arguments, beyond my internal sense of guilt and frustration, to a glimpse of what it might have been like. What fun, what intimacy, what mutual teasing and flirting we might have been party to. And it is there that the limit sense of how one is interpolated into a conflict and its structuring arguments and subject positions falls away in the imaginative moments in which you inhabit the situation so totally differently at another register. Now, the, the, um, so I'm thinking about moments of temporal suspension in which we cannot be held and contained by a logic in which an optimistic thought is not a celebration of possibilities, but the actual betrayal of everything that you have been indoctrinated to think. Not do-gooding, not orientalist, not corrective, not hopeful, but like the thoughts of Jean Genet explores in Prisoner of Love, they are the actualization of a paradigm shift and the redefinition of one's sense of belonging. And so, uh, to end with, I want to go back to the, some of the terms um, that, that um, I introduced in relation to the way in which a whole set of emergent kind of, of critical discourses and activist um, and, and imaginative interventions um, have also produced another sense of exhausted geography, not exhausted geography in terms of territorial divisions, but an exhausted geography in terms of, let's say, the, the sort of, of both the legitimacy of movements of subjects, um, the, the, their ability to participate um, beyond those restrictions, their ability to contaminate um, the the culture to which they they have um, in which they have arrived, and their ability to produce, you know, by contamination I mean the ability to produce the the um, s the supposedly stable culture as itself lacking in legitimation. Right, and and that is, I think, the the sort of contemporary set of geographical exhaustions that we have um, sort of ar arrived at. Now, uh, we um, it's 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 one of those sort of very interesting things that uh, the rhetorics of stable geographies, the rhetoric of migration restrictions. Uh, the rhetoric of stable borders that are actually able to do the, the work of containment and division has to wrestle, and this is why I call these rhetorics an alibi, because they have to wrestle with a whole state of growing instabilities. One of these is so-called international terror. Now, the... the this is an incredible challenge to stable geographies. Stable geographies that are based on the notion of, of borders um, that can be armed and defended and used as a set of blockages. Whereas, in fact, the terroristic, as it's em emerged in, in this, this particular phase, terroristic has been with us since the dawn of time, and um, the, the way in which it's emerged in this most recent phase of the last decade has been through primarily spatial instability. Right? So if one thinks of the hallmarks of the terroristic, as exploding planes and exploding cars and exploding bodies. If one thinks of um, piracy 
um, within uh, international territorial waters, as has been happening off the coast of Africa. If we think of so much of the manifestations of, inter of, of, of the workings of, of the terroristic, what we have is a kind of challenge to the to the the stability of geographical borders that cannot protect, right? It doesn't really matter how many armored divisions and how much barbed wire and how many sort of, of, of regimes of control. And so the 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 protection then moves into these kind of bureaucratic regulating mechanisms about who's allowed to come in and who's allowed to go out. Um, and going out is as much a problem as, as coming in. Um, and this, this is one huge set of challenges to a kind of traditional inherited geographical stability where things can actually um, be, where, where protection can take place, right? So we, we, have, um, we have that. Um, a parallel instability is one, uh, the one of, of global markets, where uh, production cannot be located. Um, it cannot be located neither at the level of production, nor at the level of distribution, d dissemination, nor at the level of, of consumption, right? It is a, a set of absolutely dispersed operations. Um, which take place across a huge gamut uh, of places and economies and modes of transportation and so on. So that again is a, a kind of huge challenge to the instability of classical geographies, national geographies. And again um, is, is sort of, of the, there are attempts to restabilize it, not through the old set of, of regulated economies, uh, but through preferential treatment in relation to certain kinds of mobility. So, for example, one of the, the most um, devastating <laughs> results of this has been that the consequence, the direct consequence of Schengen visa regulations, which allow the Euro mobility of Europeans within the European Union, has been to virtually imprison Africans within Africa. So not only are the external borders of Africa impassable now, but internal mobilities within Africa, as a, re as a direct result of, of Schengen policies, have been um, fortified because, of course, the idea is that one does not want um, people to move close to border passage areas, right? So you don't want them to move to North Africa. You don't want them to cross the Sahara. You don't want them to be able to enter Europe through Turkey or through Morocco or through Algeria or through Tunisia or through the southern borders of Spain. And so there, there is a kind of solidification of border regimes in Central Africa that doesn't allow people to move to the coasts of Africa and affects, you know, everything from kinship to, to local economies. So we have numerous levels in which a kind of instability to classical national geographies has been affected, and then a whole set of bureaucratic regimes that are attempting to restabilize them. And that is where the notion of the common, the mutual, the shared, the notion of stakeholding, the notion of co-citizenship, the notion of subaltern production, right? Production that is not within the, the sort of global dispersed economies, but are operating at another level and subject to another set of, of distributions, have become so important for us in terms of thinking of how to exhaust the regimes of geography. So these are kind of the two tracks along which I um, have been thinking about how we exhaust geographies. So we will have time for 
two, three questions, so and then we will have a young presentation, and then we will have general a joint discussion. discussion. Yeah. Discussion. Okay. Okay. So Magda Ratinska. <laughs> Magda Ratinska. <laughs> Magda Ratinska. Very nice to see you after a few years. Um, I've got a question related to your story about the party. Party usually requires invitation unless it's a, a you know uninvited. Um, I don't know how. What's the good phrase in English for for this rave? Rave, yes. <laughs> but assuming uh, assuming we're talking about this very friendly party, you've been invited to. How to facilitate the condition of being invited in the context of what you of everything that you said about this re-solidification of regimes while at the same time something's trying to escape? Well, the story of the party, it's really about within a certain kind of sociability in which people transcend their birthplaces and we've all experienced this, you know, the, the sort of, of in, on, on not home ground one can produce all kinds of sociabilities and mutualities. Um, the sort of, of sudden worry about whether somebody like me would feel comfortable in that kind of milieu. But the story of the party is really the, the, um, the precisely the non-address, right? The non-address of conflict, the non-address of geographical division, the possibility of the whole thing just collapsing um, through this utterly charming notion of such excellent Arabs, you know, which is kind of a self compliment. Yes. Um, and the the sort of, of and what I liked about that particular moment is that it wasn't reconciliation. It was just collapse. You know, you you couldn't translate this, you know, endless, interminable conflict back into this moment. It had annihilated it. And that's what I liked about this moment. And that's why, you know, I've told the story. Um, but I think, you know, the, the basis for the invitation is just really banal sociability and nothing <laughs> more than that. Well, maybe one more question? Okay. Um, just some comments and thank you very much for an extremely interesting talk which I'll have to go away and think about a lot. <laughs> um, just one little linguistic point in Russian, which is my subject. Blizhny Vostok is near east, and so other people have exhausted geography. Well, you know, they present linguistically, it's near them, and that's another rather nationalistic, imperialistic country. Um, I wondered, you eventually went away from geography and talked about politics. Uh, um, why couldn't you talk about exhausted politics? Well, than exhausted geographies. I, I, I um, think I am talking about yeah. exhausted politics, but I'm trying to address it in terms of, of geography, because I, I think that uh, ge geography has a kind of way of naturalizing everything, right? It's a given, it's a given that there are nation states, it's a given that we're divided into five continents. There weren't nation states before the 19th century. Yeah, but in, in, a, in a sort of, of modern body of knowledge, these are givens, and they're actually highly constructed and hugely manipulated. So, uh, sort of categories, and um, there's an enactment of a lot of, of, of political structures that relies on the naturalization of geography for its kind of persuasion, right? There, uh, there seems to be some kind of, of overall agreement with the fact that one should not border, cross a border illegally. Why should one not cross border illegally? What logics, you know, are at play that are actually persuasive? Of course, there are mechanisms of control. So you will be arrested, you will be imprisoned, you will be deported, and so on. But those are mechanisms of control. What interests me are what logics of persuasion are at play that make us agree that this is something not to do. Right, that 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 there is 
sort of division and containment that needs to be upheld, that it's about difference and difference needs to be maintained and so on. And we enact it at the level of the national, and then we enact it at the level of the regional, and the EU is an enactment of precisely the same logic, and it's then detrimentally affected, you know, other places around the globe. So the, the, um, the reason I talk about geography and geographical exhaustion is that geography sustains the ability of absolutely bankrupt politics to perpetuate themselves in a kind of naturalized way. And so that's why I talk about geography. Thank you. Um, so shall we hold the discussion for, uh, for a little while and uh, Jan Rajkowska and her presentation. I would like to mention that it's really great honor for me to um, be able to relate my project, one of them, um, to exhaustive geographies um, because it's, it's a fantastic background for it. And um, I've been thinking about uh, what to present tonight. And uh, my heart told me to talk about Born in Berlin, which is a very simple concept of giving birth to a child in Berlin. I am Polish, so naturally it was a, a difficult decision because this is traditionally a place where the destruction would come from. But um, um, it was just too emotional because the whole project, in a way, ended up in a, in a catastrophe. So I decided not to talk about it and present a really gloomy project, which is called Sumpfstadt, which is a German word for swamp town. Um, and it, the idea for Zumpfstadt, for Swamp Town, came to me when I was in Japan, um, attending a conference about the institutional mission of the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw. Um, and I didn't sleep for 10 days, so I basically, I was locked up in my room in a, in a hotel and I stared out of the window and I was uh, actually <coughs> focusing uh, on Berlin. Uh, so, yeah. I will read the story. This is a part of my book. It will be published this year by, uh, by Zero Books. And uh, I thought that that would be the best uh, kind of frame for uh, exhaustive geographies. So I was focusing on Berlin while looking at Tokyo mm -hmm. and wondering about the tragedy of landscape, which naturally led me to read about the romantic concepts of landscape and about Caspar David Friedrich. The immobility of Tokyo skyline and its quietness were overwhelming. Even the birds seemed silent. At a distance of 8,913 kilometers, Berlin also seemed far away in time. And I started to think about innocence. In Berlin, we lived near Schlossplatz, now covered in, gra in grass. Here, three years earlier, the Palais de Republic, the pride of the GDR, had been demolished. The grass was fresh. Memories of, pa of the palace, too. When we arrived in Berlin, all that remained were perfectly flat spaces, wooden walkways cutting across them, perhaps to prevent people being overwhelmed by the vast emptiness. And I started to take photographs of this place. Uh, that's a contact sheet. So one of these white green spaces had been excavated. We could see the city's buried skeleton down into the cellars of the Prussian palace, which stood there before the communist authorities decided to replace it with the Palace de Republic. I thought about the innocence of this place, trying to avoid the dangerous territory of guilt. Is it possible to think about innocence without considering guilt? The Palais de Republic was officially opened in 1973. Over 56,000 tons of concrete and 19,000 tons of steel and iron were used in its construction. The windows covered more than 8,000 square meters of the facade. 
the place was filled with asbestos, which helped to seal the decision to bring about its end. Because of the new number of lamps installed to illuminate it, it was one of the brightest spots in East Berlin, which was otherwise a rather dark city. The popular program Ein Kassel Buntes, uh, A Colorful Cauldron, was filmed there. It was called the House of the People, or the People's Parliament, though it was an icon of thoroughly inhuman regime. After the fall of communism, the decision was made to demolish it. Many artists and intellectuals rose up in its defense. Once, as a young girl, I saw the building. After the trip, I delighted in staring at my slides, showing the orange opaqueness of its innumerable windows. And indeed, it was an um, absolutely fantastic building. And this is one of the glass lamps that was, um, if I remember, five meters, uh, meters high. Um, and here I'll stop uh, my reading for a moment just to show you a really fantastic project uh, which was done during the uh, demolition of the, uh, um, of the Palais de, de Republic. And this is the uh, view on the Schlossplatz uh, from the Fernsey to the uh, TV tower during the demolition of the, uh, uh, of the Palais de Republic. Uh, this is when they were taking down the asbestos and these set of photographs I found, it's, uh, they are taken by uh, Ralph Lomberg, um, who done a really great project, which I briefly would like to present here, uh, because he decided to um, pose a question, which means a doubt. So these <laughs> giant, uh, gigantic letters landed on the top, um, on the roof of the, uh, of the Palace de the Republic. Uh, this is the Z landing on its roof, and it was the scale of this project was really enormous. I think it's a, one of the examples of really um, very good intervention in the public space in a, a very right political moment. And now I'm coming back uh, to my story, to the history of the uh, Schlossplatz. Its predecessor, Berliner Stadtschloss, Berlin City Palace, itself as heavy as Prussian politics, was built in the 15th century, during the reign of Frederick II Ironclough, and continuously modified thereafter. The palace was the seat of the Hohenzollern dynasty throughout the age of absolutism and until the end of the German Empire in the year 1918. Uh, here on the balcony, we see the um, uh, Frederick Wilhelm giving a speech. But uh, balconies were frequently used for political appearances and speeches. This is during the revolution, 1918. Um, that's another great picture from 1918. And of course, after the Weimar Republic, the palace was taking part in a, in a, um, a Nazi regime as well. Uh, yeah, I found these photographs in the uh, Norwegian, Norwegian archives. And that's after the war, heavily bombed after du uh, during the Second World War and consumed by fire. It was used after the war as a backdrop for the Soviet <coughs> film Battle of Berlin. Live artillery rounds were fired at it during filming the salvos destroying around a quarter of the western facade along with the palace grounds. The most heroic images of the palace were taken after the end of the war. It was scarred but much more beautiful and dramatic in appearance than it had been in, in its intact state. Nazis, with their enthusiasm for ruins, would have been delighted at the manner in which it was decomposing. And here is the uh, bird's eye view, here's the palace. This photograph was um, taken by the British uh, who just made sure that the job was done. In the late 40s, parts of the uh, Berliner Stadtschloss were repaired and used in, as, ex as exhibition spaces. Among others, it hosted a show entitled 
reunion with the museum con museum's contents, which included works of art that the Nazis had labeled degenerate. And these are a couple of exhibitions. As I think that was the really glorious time of this building. Uh, and here is the opening of the uh, reunion with the museum's contents. Very important exhibition. The palace was finally laid to rest in 1950 when it was demolished as a symbol of Prussian militarism. Just one balcony was saved from destruction, the one Karl Liebknecht uh, had made a speech from in 1918. It was from this balcony that Liebknecht announced the formation of the German Socialist Republic and so ended over 400 years of royal residence within the palace walls. Uh, that's this bit here. And it has been moved and put together, back together in a, in a slightly different place. They really wanted to save it symbolically for, for the history, I mean, of course, communists. Uh, which I think looks quite gorgeous now in this, mm -hmm. in this place. The Bundestag finally voted to rebuild the palace in 2007. It was an absurd idea from a political, conservational, and historical point of view. The result of a lack of vision that is the German disease of the 21st century. So we're going back in time. This is uh, <coughs> Palace de Republic, and this is, of course, the uh, Prussian Palace. And um, I bought this postcard uh, last year in Berlin. So it's a, it's a very active political campaign to really rebuild the, uh, the palace. It will be rebuilt. So now is the, uh, actually, what the project begins. I thought that the most direct journey back to innocence would be a return to pre-linguistic and prehistoric times. I imagined Schlossplatz as a plot of waterlogged, unstable land covered with green foliage, sweet flag, rushes and sedges, reeds, sand dew, frogs and cranes, beavers, herons, ospreys and koipu. Fallen tree trunks, meadows, drops of dew trembling on spider webs, green slimy sludge, mud and turf. A smell that refreshes one deep down in the lungs. Cold, mist covered box and silt, layers of mouldering leaves, the organic remains of fish, frog and turtle carcasses. Dogs which strayed and fell into the water and never climbed back out. I also imagined people watching all this from various view viewing points, studying new kinds of moss and water snakes through binoculars because the swamp would be inaccessible for humans. Paradoxically, the description of the swamp made sense in Polish, in the Slavic onomatopoeic lexicon. I listened to the sounds the words made. Szmielojad, świerszczaki, drzęczki, potrzosy, trzciniaki and trzciniczki, czerwończyk nieparek and mieniak strożnik, wierzbawa, wierzba czerniawa and storczyk krwisty, not to mention kwokacze. <laughs> These would be the new inhabitants of Schlossplatz, animals and plants. So I want to distance myself at this point at, from any um, nationalistic point of view. It's just a pleasure of, of pronouncing <laughs> uh, onomatopoeic Slavic words. I remember that the word burl, I'll come back to it. Oh. Yeah. I remember that the word burl means swamp in many Slavic languages. According to its etymology, in the old Polabians language spoken by the Wends, burl or burl means marsh or swamp and is presumed to relate to the, to the location of the old town and the marshes around the river Spre. It probably gave Berlin its name. The nearest equivalent words in Polish that I know of are Bełtać and Bełt. Either way, I felt I should escape language because language means consciousness, guilt, and the need for justice. And here is the, um, actually the project a vision of, let's say, impossible public project. Uh, the uh, Schlossplatz turned into a, into a swamp. 
The swamp was an escape. In a literal sense, it would be giving back a place contaminated by political violence into the hands of nature and an admission of complete powerlessness. Conversely, it would also be a celebration of the German romantic tradition of conceptualizing nature. It's another embodiment of, of the swamp, same place, with the uh, Liebknecht balcony kept <laughs> intact. <laughs> Well, I didn't want to destroy anything, basically. Mm -hmm. I wanted to leave it as it was, but I wanted to use all this area, um, make it inaccessible for humans, <coughs> and leave it for nature, just seal it. Principally, it was, this was my rejection of the weight of German guilt and of the necessity on, of confronting it face to face. And further, I thought, it was necessary to return to the city an area of innocence when everything was still possible, when nature was suspended in a state of potentiality, and when history itself was still unwritten. Not only because there was no language to write it with, but because the inevitable had not yet happened. And this is probably the most romantic view of the uh, Schlossplatz. This is all taken, all these photographs are taken uh, in Berlin. Uh, the swamps are also um, near Berlin in Peacock Island, uh, which is essentially part of Berlin. So it's all the uh, local uh, vegetation. Um, yeah, um, and now two things, because it followed the whole idea, the whole fantasy about Schlossplatz was followed by a, a larger vision <laughs> uh, of a of the mass uh, exodus um, in 19, wait, in late 40s, uh, which I would like to accompany with the moving image. And then I would like to quickly go back to the maps of Berlin, going back in time from 2007 to, let's say, early medieval ages, uh, a couple of them. But um, I prepared something for you, stealing, of course, archival footage. Mm. Uh, but I think it's, uh, it's so interesting that I just couldn't can resist. This is Berlin, uh, 1945. <coughs> the vision of a swamp was followed by the fantasy of a spontaneous, spontaneous mass exodus of the population of Berlin in the late 40s. Just as it is necessary to desert a place contaminated by a nuclear explosion, so one should leave behind a place stained with guilt, collaboration and indifference. Columns of civilians without any orders from the authorities, dragging the remains of their worldly goods and carts, surviving horses, pulling wagons filled with ripped duvets, dirty, impoverished children, straight from the last remaining Hitlerian squads, women and the elderly, looking regretful by, but determined. All of this passed before my eyes. Instead of building Trimmerbergs, mountains of rubble, and uh, fastidiously restoring their townhouses and palaces, they had decided to leave their city to the forces of nature, the waters of the Spre and its tributaries, canals and underground channels. The waters slowly rose and flooded sewers, filled basements, burst through manholes and ran down streets. Berlin, once again, was what it had before it became a city, a borough, a swamp, a marshland. Uh, it was, um, yeah, Bundesarchiv. I think they'll forgive me somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now the maps, a couple of maps. This is, yeah, this is 2007. And um, uh, Palace de Republic. Not existent though. I don't know what they. It is still there, but it's, um, this is uh, 1932. So we, we see the uh, Schlossplatz still here, obviously, it's there. 1910, it's here. 1830 very pronounced in the middle. 
and here with its gardens. Sixteen fifty two. This is twelve thirty, and we see the river expanding in a way. And then I didn't manage, but that's my uh, next task for the project to make the uh, map of Berlin from before when we don't have any actually dwellings, just the uh, just the marshes. So yeah, this is this is it. Actually, this is the Zumstadt. And um, I just wanted to say that thinking about exhaustive geographies, what I really like, like about it is that it's so hot. It's a, it's a hot thinking, you know. It's a, it's a desire, basically, that is, lies behind it. And this is why I, I could relate to it uh, with my uh, dreamy projects. Um, and I think that um, it's in a way of forcing a miracle, you know, and believing that it is possible. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, I propose we have a s uh, discussion now. And uh, please uh, introduce yourself uh, before as uh, uh, asking the questions, because we are uh, recording it. And uh, then uh, we will have a little bit of uh, a glass of wine, a small uh, reception, so um, we can continue the discussion. Okay? All right. I mean, I, I, I wanted to say that this is a, it's, it's a really beautiful sort of, of, of um, effort. It really in a whole other way of exhausting geography, you know, that, so I, I feel it's like I got a gift you know, that expands the the ability of a term like this to work. And I, I think it's really interesting because you started with Palace de République, which was oddly also one of my favorite buildings because mm -hmm. in negotiating the difficulties of East Berlin, it was one of the few places you could just go into at any hour and get a cup of coffee and a cake, and which was a notoriously difficult endeavor in East Berlin in the 80s. And um, so I, I think that this is one level of, you know, the, the destruction of Palace de Republic is one level of exhausting geography, the disappearance of the GDR, and then the, the sort of, of, of the replacement of many layers of German sort of, you know, publicly manifested history with a swamp um, is another one. So it, it feels like a, a really wonderful additional realm in which to think this notion of how to exhaust geography. Yana, would you, would you like to comment now or shall we? Uh, well, maybe I just should add what was already said that it's a. Um, it is a uh, an act almost of powerlessness, really, a lack of language, mm -hmm. um, a personal inability almost to to face it. Actually, when well, I never thought that being in Berlin will be so overwhelmingly difficult. Mm -hmm. We. Well, I have no idea that the, the city actually embodies all its history in the buildings, in the architecture, in the, mm -hmm. in the, uh, in the setup, in the structure. So being there and being pregnant there was absolutely, um, yeah, dreadful actually, <laughs> <laughs> I should say. So um, yeah, that was my, uh, yeah, lack of, lack of language which manifested itself in the project in a very uh, direct way. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I thought that's, when you, when you can't do anything, you just drop it and, uh, and, and then you just run away. And that was my escape. <laughs> so. so you evacuate it. Yeah. Shall yeah. we gather a few questions and then uh, we can come back. Any questions? really difficult time hearing back here for the last two hours, so um, it's actually uh, good to hear something. It's <laughs> my, my own voice at the moment. I have a question about 
exhaustion and the act of recognition. Uh, because it's exhaustion and the act of recognition. Because it seems to me that both arguments are intimating that the only way to recognize, and I, I mean recognize in the sense of awareness, consciousness, um, uh, the act of apprehension, which is already a more aggressive concept, that the only way, it's almost like um, a, sense, a sense of giving up, the only way to recognize something is to become exhausted. And the exhaustion you're describing is a narrative exhaustion, it's an exhaustion of language, it's a conceptual exhaustion, but also exhausted geographies. So my question is, what is the relationship between geography and space and decay? Because it seems to me that there is another form of linguistic turn or a language that, especially Joanna in, in her last presentation, imposes through nature, connecting nature to the act of innocence. I mean, nature is not innocent. Nature is mute. Uh, it's innocence. It's the act of ascription that makes nature innocent. Uh, so it's already a sort of a linguistic imposition onto the space, which is actually turning space into a geography, turning space into a form of boundedness uh, that otherwise would not have existed. Your presentation reminded me of W, uh, I think it's Zebalt in, um, in the short history of destruction, when he talks about the bombing campaign against the German cities at the very end of the war, uh, Dresden and places like that, and, and the firestorm that raged, raged for days on end, and then the sudden quiet. And he was wondering about how do we recognize, how do we represent this sort of tragedy, this sort of destruction. And the only thing that he could come up with was the millions of flies that took over as one wandered through the ruins. And the sudden shrubbery, the life came back. That's nature. You know, you might call it cruel, uh, because it's a presence of life, where life has been evacuated. But is it innocent, right? So is nature, could nature actually also be a marker for guilt and destruction, not only innocent? So it goes, it goes back to the sort of sense of recognizing things and recognition and redrawing boundaries. I think I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. We will gather maybe two more well, questions that, that and that then we will... That is, is quite a complex yeah. sort of... Mm -hmm. of yeah. Well, but why don't we just we one more and then we can comment like this. Uh, okay, so... Uh, Ros um, <coughs> I just want to, to thank Joanna very much. Uh, is that how you pronounce your name? I put you in a footnote. Um, sorry, I... I I wanted to thank Joanna very much. I put her in a footnote without knowing her because of feminist art and her views on Poland and how art might bring people together in a multicultural way. Um, my name is Marsh, actually, which is uh, fascinating. So maybe I come from the primeval swamp and that's why I'm not a typical English woman and have studied all these foreign cultures. But I always thought it was because I was a peasant. Uh, you come from peasant stock, Anglo-Saxon stock, uh, living you know, near a marsh. Um, a bog. Um, so that's fascinating. It is very feminist imagery, by the way. Women, water, um, as I try and show in my book on s Central European women's writing. <laughs> it's, uh, you bring up a really complex you know, conjunction of things, and I don't know that I can reply. I don't. I don't think I have a reply. But I think that, and and what I found really lovely, and this is entirely to Johanna's credit of actually thinking about what she would do in response to the notion of exhausted geographies. Um, I, I think that. There is, there is a sort of, of I mean, as, as, as I tried to say this in relation to a previous question. The, the notion of exhausting geography is the notion of evacuating a set of legitimating logics or narratives that sustain a sort of whole set of politics. So the replacement of one building with another building, the, the sort of erasure of a hundred years of history, 
in order to transcend the whole set of conflicts, which is what's happening in the with the Berlin Schloss. Um, uh, in a way, I would want to answer you through the work of somebody that I collaborate closely with, an artist um, in Israel called Reli de Fries, who um, has has been sort of, of doing a series of projects which I always think of are a corollary to my sort of exhausted geographies. She, um, and I'll try very, very briefly to sketch two projects. One of them has to do with a plant. Um, she's a, um, a geologist and a landscape architect and an artist, and she works with all these bodies of knowledge simultaneously, informing one another. And um, she's been on the track of this plant, which is called the Akub, and it's a very, very central plant to the Palestinian kitchen. And it grows in the hills of Judea and Samaria. And it's a very unusual plant because it starts racinated. And then once it begins to bear fruit, it detaches itself from its roots and it becomes a tumbleweed. So she's been hot on the tracks of this plant. Its local histories, its culinary histories, and so on. Now, this is a plant that refuses to subjugate itself to the geographical logics of the region. It won't stay in place. One of the things that Zionism did when it arrived um, in the 19th century um, in in the Eastern Mediterranean was it set up a huge set of local knowledges. It named the fauna, it named the flora, it named the, the geographical and geological formations. It produced all that as a massive body of knowledge, which wasn't there locally before. Uh, but of course, it also, through this body of knowledge, co you know, controlled it. So one of the things, and this I didn't know until until I encountered her work, was that within the Zionist body of, of, of the knowledge of fauna and flora, there are good plants and bad plants. Good plants are those that allow themselves to be domesticated. Bad plants are those that refuse domestication. The akub is a bad plant. And so she did this wonderful um, piece of work called The Yakub and the Company of Bad Plants, um, which was uh, about the, 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 the kind of the histories and, and, the, and the mobilities of, of this plant. And in the middle of, this, of, of her very elaborate installation project, there was a piece that she'd taken off the television news which was just a, a, a 10 second documentary fragment in which something called the Green Commando, there is a Green Commando that polices um, conserved plants and the movement of bad plants and the, the, the worry about bad plants contaminating good plants. It's kind of a plant apartheid. Um, the, the, there was this Green Commando chasing a group of Palestinian housewives in traditional dress and yelling at them with no irony whatsoever, go home, <laughs> right? Stop picking these plants. You're not allowed to pick these plants. This is a conserved plant, and so on and so on. So the, the sort of, of now, in, in this work, there is the sort of, of, in a way, the battle of two geographies at work. Right, a kind of the, a, an imposition which is ideological and geographical and one made up of categories. Another another piece that she's been working on for a long time is that the colonial geography of the Near East is uh, longitudinal. Um, the the sort of in the same way that Africa was divided. Um, the Near East was divided between the French and the British along long, longitudinal lines. This has to do with the long coastline and access to that coastline and la lines of transportation and so on. And so all of the kind of, of, of post-colonial national conflicts that have emerged have uh, been along longitudinal <coughs> lines. What she's been doing 
is researching what's called the Syrian African fault line. This is a vast um, fissure, um, a, a geological fissure, um, that has to do with the movement of tectonic plates. It's about 40,000 years old. And she's produced a counter geography, which is latitudinal, right? And which cuts across uh, both the colonial legacies, the nationalist enmities, the, the shipping trajectories and points of access to the sea, and so on. And she's produced a counter geography which reads the region completely differently along an age old geological fault line. And I, I think it's, it's there. You know, it's there that there are the sort of possibilities. I, I like her work very much. I, I find, I learn, uh, you know, and, and in, in the same way, you know, that you've just, you know, like evacuated all the buildings. I, I learn sort of imaginative possibilities for other points of entry into, into um, knowledge production, which I think are really important. And so it's there. You know, th these are the kind of points of exhaustion where, where you show up the logics, but not criticize them, not say, well, this is the legacy of this and this is, you know, bad Zionist knowledge and this is bad post-colonial sort of, of, of legacies and so on. But you, in a way, t pull the rug out from under them. You say, no, that, that's just a constructed geographical knowledge. Right? There's a whole other geography to the region. Or there's a whole, you know, or there are plants that absolutely refuse border regimes. And they won't stay in place. You know, and, and they create weird connections between places like Gaza and the West Bank that are not allowed to have a connection. But the Akub, it moves around very quickly and it makes connections. And so these are kind of the notions of geographical exhaustion or the way in which you can exhaust geography. Do you want to say something to that? Um, well, thinking about, in a sense, that you um, pointed out, is, um, I think that, of course, a swamp, as we call it, is a, also a construct. You know, it's a, we invented a swamp in a way. A swamp doesn't know that it's a, it's a swamp. So it's a construct in the construct. We, you know, the further we move, the, the you know, we're inside of the box of the box of the box. So, uh, of course, plants are not innocent, obviously. Especially those who, there's one plant that um, really likes the ruins, for example. Uh, then wherever the bomb falls um, and creates a crater, this is the first plant that appears. So. It's ambiguous always, but you know this, this project has lots of contradictions. It contains, it's built on contradictions. So on one hand, it's based on romantic tradition, of course, the vision, the nature, and the culture, and blah blah blah. We staying outside of the uh, nature, mm -hmm. so it's also there. So it's all big lie in a way. I want to read you a little something from Toni Morrison, which I skipped, but I think as a gesture. She says, you know they straightened out the Mississippi River in places to make room for houses and livable acreage. Occasionally the river floods these places. Floods is the word they use. But in fact, the river is not flooding. It is remembering, remembering where it used to be. All water has perfect memory and is forever trying to get to where it was. And so, <laughs> yes. Okay. It's a little bit idealizing nature in a sense, isn't it? Oh. Well, uh, we have a uh, few more minutes. Mm, questions? I guess I was wondering about the term, about the word um, exhausted, and why you'd come to that word or it had come to you. And I started remembering a, a title of a, a book by Deborah Levy, a wonderful writer. Sw is it Swallowing Geography or Swallow Geography? It's something. I might be misremembering it. And I started trying to use the term swallowed instead of exhausted and wondering 
because um, that it's just, so it's just a comment really, not a properly formulated question. But but I suppose exhausted has a sense of well, so many senses, but of erosion, of seeping away, of um, slackening and falling, as well as allowing new inrushes. Whereas swallowing is a more sort of personal activity in one way, but, but also a hugely widening out activity as well. I suppose a swamp is precisely a swallow geography. I don't, know. I don't think of exhaustion as tiredness. Right? It's not a, a lull. It's hugely energetic. And it's about the it's about the, the sort of moments in which something just implodes in on itself without battle, right? And therefore, I think it's hugely productive. I borrow it from Deleuze. It's, it's a term that Deleuze uses. And for him, it's, um, it's, it's a kind of, it's an ethical, it's an ethical position. And it's one of abdication, um, of, of sort of ab abdication on the rules of the game. Um, there's a really interesting book that I like a lot by Andre Lepecki called Exhausting Choreography, which is about the current sort of, of set of developments within choreography, um, in which the all of the traditional languages of choreography, all of the, the grammar that the body was subjected to as choreography have been exhausted. And one needs to rebuild the relation between bodily presence and gesture and manifestation in a completely different way. So it's, you know, it, it, it gets used in different places at that moment in which something collapses inwardly and just is unsustainable and it's a it's an optimistic desire on my part that geography as it restricts us collapse or implode so it's really a projection of an optimistic desire thank you thinking about the movement of people when you mentioned the Schengen visas for example um, so there is an exerting power, there is a body that has decide, decided about these rules of migration and movement of people. From an experience I've had my own, it seems like not even the people that are controlling it are aware of it. And not to talk about the citizens, as in I am Serbian, so I need a visa almost everywhere. Until recently, I needed one for the Schengen states as well. Many people that I come across, they don't know this, but I wouldn't expect them. But yes, from a police officer. My story is that um, I had a permission to return to Spain because I was waiting for my new residency to be um, renewed. And I asked a Greek officer if I can enter first to Greece because I had to go there. And he said to me, of course, it's in the EU. You can go wherever you want. If you can enter Spain, of course, you can enter Greece. I said, OK. So I go back to my country, and returning to Greece, I get deported. And I said, but I asked an officer, and they were like, well, he didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so would you consider that also as just not exhausting geography, but just negating the geography that's been constructed? Because after that, because I really, really had to go to Greece, what I did was fly to Spain, and then from Spain enter to Greece as of nothing, you know? <laughs> so basically going from my country directly, I couldn't, but doing the whole circle and going first to Spain, and then there were no borders between Spain and Greece, obviously I was able to go into Greece. It's just, you know, the fact that somebody's imposing some rules, but then they don't know the rules themselves. It's kind of like a negation of it's complicated. I know it's complicated, but it's just another way of seeing, you know, geography not in border terms, but in terms of mentality and construction and knowledge, if you want. I, I think, I, I really do think that um, these are restrictions. They have 
local, certain kinds of local justifications, whatever they are. But in essence, they are a way of replacing restrictive traditional national geographies with border regimes. So they're an alibi to try and reconstitute a kind of, of historical set of national ge geographies with a new set of bureaucracies that restrict the movement of people. And so the, the I think, uh, you know, while I might want all of geography to evacuate itself and, and implode, um, this is not generally shared by the powers that be. And so, but it's also with, you know, between the EU, GATT, NAFTA, trade agreements, deregulation agreements, the fact that the EU needs 12 million additional workers in order to sustain itself economically while laying down all these restrictions to immigration, you know, between all of these facts, it's extremely difficult to re regroup the old national geographies. It's really very difficult because they've been substituted. So you do it through the production of these kind of border regimes. That's how it it's gets like done. Giving the identity with nationalism back. That's yeah, because it, it, it speaks in, in, in the language of national identity, mm -hmm. but it's not about national identity. It's about about fantasies of independent economies that Euro the European Union states are trying to sell to the population of the Euro European Union. I mean, no nobody says, well, we need 12 million more workers, but we're going to restrict immigration. So we're going to, in a way, shoot ourselves in the foot economically because we can't produce what we need to produce. We can't service our own needs. We can't do this. We can't. That's not the language that you hear. You hear jobs, you know, British jobs for British people, immigration law, etc. Yeah, everywhere. You, you hear this sort of, of everywhere. Yeah. Welfare straight is, state is stretched because it can't. But, you know, those are not the realities. That if, if capital is moving around and goods are moving around and labor is moving around and services are moving around and everything is outsourced, how do you rebuild a convincing logic about keeping people in place. You know, these are these are sort of, of so you use the old classical nineteenth century models yeah. of geographical borders. Which for everything else as porous as hell. I think it's an alibi discourse. I think a language I mean it must be a conscious decision to use this outdated language that completely doesn't cover anything. Exactly. And our notion of, you know, yeah. of borders and how It's comforting. Yeah. It's very masculine. <laughs> I just remember when I studied sociology in Warsaw in the beginning of the 90s, uh, one of uh, uh, my professors, Professor Jadwiga Staniszkis, she coined the, the term um, implosion in relation to, the, uh, to how she described the collapse of communism, uh, which starts, you know, um, in the in the whole region, and uh, the way she 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 uh, used the word was exactly related to the exhaustion of the system and not to the kind of peaceful ways of making revolution. That was her vocabulary, and I remember we all were kind of fascinated by the fact that it was really a tired regime, uh, and it, it was Marisha. You, you probably remember it, you know, this tiredness even better, or how it how it worked. So. Just you know, just this remark that it, it can be possible, but at the same time, as you rightly said, it's never an, a, a state. Mm -hmm. It's ju it was just a suspended moment of of, of all institutional beings and modes of acting, uh, uh, getting really bored and tired and not knowing what to do next. Mm -hmm. But then the, these uh, future s scripts of of acting they they somehow um, reappeared in different forms, and there are obviously different. Geograph geographies right now uh, much more um, mobile and fluid for some of some of us at least 
And this is interesting in having two projects in such different registers side by side <coughs> and kind of making them talk to one another, which I think is always a really, you know, not forcing it, but just a, 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 in a kind of porous way, get, getting them to sort of... And I was talking yesterday to um, a friend of mine at Goldsmiths who's a sociologist who, um, in the wonderful way in which the world is now her work, has been that she's commissioned a post-colonial mass that was performed um, for a large orchestra, choir, and singers. That was performed at Coventry Cathedral, which is a cathedral that was bombed and rebuilt. And um, and it's, it was really interesting because it was performed a week before David Cameron went to India and refused to apologize for the massacre at Amritsar. And we were talking about how these two things just st sit side by side and complete a circuit, right? So there's the this lunkhead of a prime minister who goes and says, well, it wasn't very good, but not bad enough to actually <laughs> elicit an apology. And then there is a sociologist, you know, who produces a post-colonial mass that sung in a British reconstructed cathedral. And and I think it these are the kinds of, of re these are these are the relations that one needs in order to recognize what happens when a rhetoric is just exhausted, vacated, pointless, and you have to produce another language, you know, to, to replace it. Okay. We can have last last question. Okay. From what I understand and also from what I remember, your work very often takes the form of a proposition of a public proposition which you put up for a debate. Um, and this debate then serves to reveal certain invisible or unspoken politics. And I, I was wondering, of course, whether you had um, tried to or tried to find a partner in Berlin to realize it, whether you had put it up for discussion. Um, and how what you, for example, call the lack of language, or how um, the fact that you are a Polish artist in Berlin, or traditional speaking coming from what you said, the place of destruction to the source of the destruction, how all of this, how all of these conflicts or other ex exhausted, and I'm not sure in which uh, sense I'm using the word now, uh, ca uh, <laughs> categories came to figure in this kind of uh, debate <coughs> in Berlin. I'm based in London now, but I spent a year in Berlin. But as alien as I'm in London, I was in Berlin. I'm a, I'm a newcomer. I'm from somewhere else, from the area where actually the, uh, the, 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 you know, the kind of... It's actually beyond the boundaries of recognizable culturally world. Well, that's truth. So Poland is just out there, you know, you never mention. In the, actually, in every language that I attend, every lecture that I attend, I'm trying to draw a map of references, of geographi geographical references. It never reaches beyond Elbe River. <laughs> it's always, I mean, traditionally, historically, <laughs> stops there from Napoleonic times. It stopped there in 19th century and, and it's still stuck on Elbe. So, okay, that's an, as an introduction. Um, of course I tried. This project, although it talks about pre-linguistic times, prehistorical times, prehistoric times, it's a, it's a future project. It's a proposal. It should be debated in Bundestag. You know, <laughs> politicians, I always say that, always should treat us seriously. It's a proposal, you know, as good as any architectural office can offer. But of course, even pushing the uh, very, um, well, indecisive, let's say, powers of Polish Culture Institute, I could do nothing, absolutely nothing. No one ever, even the, uh, the, the Greens, uh, <laughs> treated it seriously. <laughs> I mean, I know it would be very funny um, kind of way of implementing it, but I would agree to, to work with the uh, Green Party, but um, yeah. It was never take it, uh, taken into um, serious con consideration. 
unfortunately, it became a, a gallery project. I don't do gallery projects. I, I'm just, I have symbolic claustrophobia. I just can't even behave, I mean, uh, move inside of the gallery walls. If I, if I do it, I just present a story from outside, uh, not even a, a, a project in terms of in visual terms. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a wallpaper, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> like many of my projects, which are strictly political, in fact. And that would have grave consequences, obviously, <laughs> for the city. <laughs> and I, you know. The political aspect struck me all the way through, and I'm, I'm really impressed by this, 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 this kind of thinking. But, you know, and as you're talking, it's, it's extremely logical. You know, and what one gets brought into it and convinced by it. But, <laughs> isn't it completely utopian? I mean, um, you know, when you talk about <laughs> politics, I wonder whether you've actually tried this in bits with any, against any Israeli politicians or any uh, Palestinian politicians, whether you've, you've tried this out in some forum where, you know, it could be applied because obviously it's, it, it's mm. a great idea, but I'm somewhat doubtful about <laughs> whether. <laughs> I think it's, it's very much akin to the desired swamp. Swamping, yeah, swamping, swamping, yeah. swamping uh, sort of that you put it there and it does what it does, right? I, Johanna doesn't think the swamp is going to be realized, and I don't think that the various territorial conflicts that I'm thinking about are going to implode into themselves. But I think you put something out there and you let it do what it does, and the the sort of, of and then all it can do really is to say, well, there's another logic. Right? The, the sort of logic doesn't have to be the replacement of one contested building with another contested building with another. You don't need to, to elide whole periods of inconvenient history. Um, you know, the, the sort of, there's another logic. And, uh, and that's what it does. So, no, it's not an effective plan, but it's a good irritant. <laughs> right? It's a good irritant. But that's, you know, we talk about change of co coordinates, yeah. you know, of complete reset, of, of something that just uh, sets up a new beginning. And I, I, I do think it is possible. It's like once meteorite lands on the border, you know, of West Bank, people will completely change the language. For example, I mean, it's one of the uh, projects, but uh, <laughs> I mean, that's what we need. We need, uh, I, I don't want to call, them, call it a miracle or just change of coordinates. Mm -hmm. Well, I really don't like being in the position when I have to so, say stop, it's not, you ha we have to finish. Well, the thing is that uh, we will, we have to now. Uh, please stay with us for a glass of uh, wine. And uh, well, just to sum up, I just wanted to Thank you very much, everyone, for coming here and uh, come here. And we, we had these uh, two wonderful presentations to kind of produce this new language, to, ex to, to, uh, to set a new questions and uh, to set the, well, the language of criticality, which you were. Uh, so which this is just the beginning. Please uh, come, uh, come back on next Wednesday. Um, uh, follow us on website, give us comments on website uh, if you wish and uh, we, we hope to, to see you again and I really apologize for not having a microphone here. I really, uh, um, well, I really asked for a microphone but I was said very, uh, very clearly that it's not necessary but I think it is actually necessary so I, I apologize for, for this. Uh, I hope, uh, uh, well, it wasn't too exhausting up down, uh, <laughs> uh, back there. But anyway, I just wanted to say thank you so much, uh, uh, Iri Drogov and uh, Jan Rajkowska for coming here. It was wonderful, it was a fascinating meeting. And uh, we will uh, see Jan Rajkowska soon, because on the 16th of October this year, there will be a presentation of her book and of her mm -hmm. projects. So we will uh, see her here very soon. And well, thank you, and uh, please uh, give uh, applaud, uh, big applause.